because we might not have time to allow everybody to speak. So we'll then pick the things Correct. in the chat and answer when we come to Q&A. Okay, Dr. Tara? And what, what, does um, Kotsi have any slides for presentation? Want to see whether they can project or he will talk? No, there are no slides. Ah, this excellent. Is, this okay. is a conversation. Okay, excellent, excellent. Then we don't need to. Welcome, Frank. Welcome, Frank. Oh. Dr. Nyaim, you know Frank? Oh. Thank you. I'm just working on my camera. It will be on in a bit. I know, no, I I know, I know Frank very well. Uh, <laughs> Dr. Yes, Kigo, I like I said, you? like I said, I've been around, so I know these people. No, you are very good, very good. Yes. Nice background, Nkosi, Nice background. Aya, ah, yeah. I'm starting the webinar so that people yes. can join in, and then uh, in the next one or so minutes, you can introduce this discussion. Thank you. Uh, is Dr. Ivan Jenga joining soon? Uh, I'll give her a call. Okay. I thought I'd just come out of the dark so that there's a bit more light. I hope you can hear me clearly. Suddenly your face is looking brighter, Jose. <laughs> <laughs> yeah, so I, I had to just come out of the so dark. So we are we are having we are having uh, participants joining in so I think uh, we can mute our mics for about one minute we are on the 60th participant already in uh, uh, 50 seconds this is going to be a very uh, well attended webinar all right okay so perhaps just uh, we could give uh, Dr. Ivan Jenga a few minutes find out uh, how far she is because I think she'll be very important to be here with us I'm, I'm, I'm getting her. I'm getting yes. her, Eli. Yes, yes. Dr. Nyaim, Dr. Eva said you can start. She will be joining in uh, about 10 minutes. All right. Thank you very much. And uh, welcome participants. Uh, this evening, it gives me a lot of joy and pleasure 
I believe this is the first of a series in terms of Kenya Medical Association engaging itself in what it's meant to do. And I uh, have the singular honor of introducing uh, the panelists. I will start with the main speaker this afternoon, who is somebody who is very well known to me. If you were to say all that he has achieved, we probably not say anything else. So we shall actually uh, shorten it, but give the important things. That is Dr. Kosis Letlape from South Africa. Uh, he's an ophthalmologist since 1989. Uh, among us, he practices in Johannesburg in private practice, but among us, the things that he has held is that he's been the president of South African Medical Association. He has also been the head of the Health Professional Councils of South Africa at some point. He is actually currently the chairman of Association of Medical Councils of Africa, AMCO, and is the president of the International Association of Medical Regulatory Authorities. Uh, he's very passionate about medical activism and he likes to see things being done well. So now that you're talking about self-regulation, I believe we could not have picked a better person to start off this conversation for us and give us the perspective of uh, South Africa, which, which to speak is actually a big, a big brother to Kenya in terms of the economic empowerment and all that. Perhaps as he speaks, he will add some more information. The next person I'd like to introduce is Dr. Honorable Dr. James Wambura Nikal. I can see he's put off his video. Dr. Nikal, are you able to put off back your video? He's known very well. Uh, currently, he's a member of parliament uh, in Kenya, representing a constituency called SEME. Uh, he sits in the health, uh, parliamentary health committee. He's a past chair, those days it was not president yet. He's a past chair of the Kenya Medical Association. And he's very passionate about the doctor's welfare. And so again, like we say, now that you're talking about self-regulation and they make policies and laws, he's a very important person to have on board. The next one I want to introduce is uh, Frank Wafula. Uh, also very well known to me, an expert in health policy, still working a lot with the government in, of, of Kenya in terms of directing policy. But in terms of uh, what he does, uh, Ofula is a senior lecturer at the Strathmore Business School and is an instrumental person in the health, uh, health management training in Strathmore Business School. So again, given that background, I believe he brings a lot of uh, experience and insight into what you want to do today. Now, the next one we shall introduce again when she comes on is our own Ivan Jenga. Ivan Jenga is currently the chair of the Kenya Medical Practitioners and Dentists Council. She was my teacher at one point in medical school. By training, she's an, an endocrinologist and also calls herself a medical anthropologist. Apart from chairing the medical council, she's also the head of the technical uh, committee on guidance on the COVID-19 issues in Kenya today. And she also uh, heads the task force that looks at the implement implementation of the universal health coverage in this country, amongst other accolades that they have. So you can see the balance we brought in people from the government, people from politics, we brought people from the academia, and we have people who have been activists in medical politics. So I want to propose that uh, we shall give our main speaker perhaps about uh, 15 minutes to give us his thoughts, and then we shall ask the other three also to take about uh, 10 minutes each, and the remaining time we shall have for Q&A and discussions. 
But meanwhile, I encourage all participants, please post as many comments and questions on the chat section as we proceed. Thank you very much. Welcome, Dr. Hossi Letlape. Uh, thank you, uh, Eli. I thought I was told I have 90 minutes to speak, so it's fine. I will rearrange my thoughts uh, so that we could have a conversation. Uh, I'd like to thank the president of the Kenyan Medical Association and other office bearers for having given me this opportunity to engage. Uh, I'd like to approach this from a slightly different angle, where we are all, we, call, we, we are Commonwealth countries. I mean, Kenya is, is in the part of the Commonwealth, South Africa is part of the Commonwealth, and our health regulatory systems are basically derived from the kingdom. The UK. So we use that system where the two important structures in the regulation of the medical professions is the board or council, depending on nomenclature in the country, and the association. The key issue is that the association is voluntary. The board is statutory. So the board or council have powers in law. Whereas the association, uh, it's a member's organization. I will start on the association side. The challenges that associations face is that sometimes they become too inward looking. Because it's a membership organization, by law and by statutes, you got to put the interests of members first. And the challenge that I had as head of the South African Medical Association for nine years was getting to convince my colleagues that even though we're in a voluntary association, our primary duty should not be to ourselves. Our primary duty should be to put the patients first. And, and it was an uphill battle to say, to convince them that our self-interest has to be subjugated to the interest of the patient. And if we put the patient first, we will not fail. Firstly, we'll be upholding our ethical commitments and the oath that we take. And two, we will always have the support of the public if we put the public first and not our own interest. Now, when you look at the ethical framework that underpins the practice of medicine. It's always about the patient. So I was fortunate that in my time in the medical association, I spent nine years in the World Medical Association as a council member, and I spent a year as their president. And the key issue is that the ethical framework is always about the welfare of the patient. You must always remember that the WMA was formed post the Second World War because of the behavior of medical doctors in Germany. And we come back to the importance of putting the patients first. Our ethical framework and our oath is about putting the patient first with reference to our teachers as well, having some respect. And there's always a challenge so that sometimes the associations uh, may become income protection organization. And they concentrate too much on the financial well being of the practitioner and sometimes lose focus of the primary purpose of being a doctor and the oath that we take. It does not mean the material conditions of doctors are not important because they are the ones that pay the membership fees to keep the association alive. Now, it is primarily because of that contract that we have with humanity, where we pledge and promise to put them first, that we've been given the privilege of self-regulation. And sometimes doctors think it is a right. No, it is not a right. It is a privilege. And it's a privilege that we've earned because of the ethos that we have portrayed. And we need to live up to those promises. 
for that to continue. And the reason we self-regulate is that we are the ones that know about what we are about. You know, you can't buy someone that's outside the profession to come and be an expert witness if there's an inquiry. And there are good reasons why we self-regulate, but we need to protect that privilege by being fit for purpose and continuing to put patients first. So you need to do a balancing act, those that are in leadership, but you are able to put patients first, but you are able to be seen by your members to be taking care of their day-to-day -day needs and their livelihoods. Now, on the regulator side, it's a statutory body. They have powers in law. And that is also the continuum of self-regulation. And generally, we control the aspects of our own training, qualification, the schools, the conferring of licensing, the degrees, the conduct of practitioners, protection of the public, and we deal with complaints. And our mission and vision in the HPCSA was about guiding the professions and protecting the public. And as long as we stay true to that and the associations understand that they are about members, but their members will only survive if they put patients first. Self-regulation will continue and will prosper. Where does self-regulation fail? Self-regulation fails when at association level, we fail to recognize that our duty is to all citizens not to the ones who can afford to pay. But increasingly, you see associations focusing largely on private practice matter, on matters of remuneration, largely. Some associations will have the union function. Sometimes the union function lies elsewhere or is neglected in other jurisdictions. And, and that is something that associations need to provide leadership on so that the membership understands that yes, we need to survive, but we survive by putting our patient first. We survive by upholding the highest ethical standards. The one area where there's always, always debate is when the profession seems to create different standards depending on whether you are a paying customer or not a paying customer. And we create different rules for those who can afford as opposed to those who can, who can afford. But when you look at the ethical rules of the profession, they got nothing to do with whether the service is rendered for free or you are on a measly salary or you are a highly paid private practitioner or a struggling private practitioner. It's about putting patients first. It's about the highest ethical standards the best possible medical treatment that the patients should have, irrespective of whether they are paying or they are not paying or how much you paid. And that is the biggest challenge that we face as doctors globally. And that's where the test of putting patient first comes in. If we become true to that, we will always be allowed to self-regulate. Now, I see a lot of associations having challenges in terms of how you deal with salary doctors and how you deal with private doctors. And because we've distanced ourselves away from advocating for better healthcare for all citizens in our nations, we find ourselves torn around those issues. And increasingly, you see a deteriorating work environment. And invariably with time, it deteriorates first in the public sector, but invariably it catches up with the private sector. The biggest threat to self-regulation, the biggest threat to the profession is corporatization. And the key structure that needs to stand up to corporatization is the association with assistance from the regulator in terms of upholding the ethical frameworks 
of the profession. You know, autonomy and independence of the profession is key. And the association and the regulator need to find, to cooperate with each other to ensure that that sacred function is kept. The autonomy of the profession cannot be sacrificed. There's a challenge nowadays in terms of uh, when you have differential care between the public and the private sector, the haves and the have nots, what is the appropriate treatment? What is the uh, clinical guidelines, et cetera, et cetera. The associations have an important role in upholding clinical guidelines, appropriate treatment, what's the best treatment for a particular condition at this point in time? What is the best treatment that you could afford to give to your citizens given your resource envelope? We should not be unmindful of the fact that there are limited resources in health, but that should not make us abdicate from our responsibility to want the best for our patients. Now, on the regulatory side, the biggest problem with regulators is that we miss the opportunity to be seen as advocates for the public and also as advocates for the profession. We end up being reduced to being where careers get destroyed and the profession sees us as the police of the profession. We should move away from that. We should emphasize that what we do is to ensure that professionals that we regulate are properly supported, are properly guided, and we work on a framework of rehabilitation. Nobody gets thrown out. It is costly to train doctors. We don't have enough of them. And we have an ethical duty to ensure that we support them to be able to work to the best of their abilities. Now there's an immense responsibility on both the regulator and the association to ensure that you have an enabling working environment that promotes ethical behavior of the professionals that you re register. Irrespective of whether that working environment is the private environment or it's in the public sector or it's in, a, it's, it's in NGOs. We have an ethical duty to advocate for better working conditions. And that is where both the association and the regulators are failing in their responsibilities. Self-regulation is important and it will only work if we work together to ensure that the working environment is conducive to ethical behavior. That's a joint responsibility. The last thing that I'd like to talk about is that Though we self-regulate, we should manage conflicts better. The profession has many people. When you have Jose Letlape being the chair of the association and being a key player in the board or in the council, there's a problem. There's a conflict of interest. There's enough of us where we should ensure that if you are an office bearer in an association, you can't be an office bearer in the regulatory body because it is important that the association keeps the regulator on its toes. Now, if you're president of both, how do you keep yourself on your toes? It just doesn't work. If you want self-regulation to prosper and to be supported, we should ensure that we manage conflicts of interest properly. The fact that we are doctors does not make us immune to conflicts of interest and we cannot double dip. You know, I remember lastly, when I was chair of the association, people wanted me to be part of the Health Professions Council of South Africa, which is the regulator. And on principle, I refused. And I said, my duty is to ensure that the regulator does its job. I can't be inside and be the watchdog. It just doesn't work. So I've moved from association, spend a decade at the helm of the associations, spend a decade in regulation. You can't participate in both if this is going to work. There has to be a working relationship between the two, but you can't have the people crossing the floor. That is where 
we go wrong. When we have people that become judge, jury, and executioner. There's enough of us that we could be self-regulating, but making sure that it works. Lastly, leaders need to be trained. The fact that you are a great clinician does not necessarily mean you're going to be a good uh, leader in the KMA or a leader in the board. We need to be trained. Regulation is taken for granted. There's no coursework and we all become experts by default. It's something that should be taken seriously. There should be a course for people that want to come onto the boards or councils. And also there should be leadership courses for people that want to come and lead on the association side. Eli, uh, thank you. And I look forward to uh, engaging when we discuss. Thank you, sir. Thank you very much, Hossi. Uh, you have not disappointed as usual. Those were very heavy thoughts that you put across. Like I said, let's pack that for the Q&A and the discussion session. And I'm encouraging the attendees, please put your comments in the Q&A section so that uh, we can pick them up uh, when the panelists are done. So having said that, I think uh, I need, I want to welcome Dr. Ivan Jenga officially now on board, I saw she joined, maybe, Yes, I can see her very well. Karibu sana, Dr. Ivan Jeng. I had introduced you in absentia. Thank you, so thank you, Mary. Know exactly. Yes, so we're very happy thank to have you. Thank I you, hope Eddie. you listened to most of uh, oh. Hossi's talk. Oh, I listened to all of it, perfect. Oh. perfect. Oh, okay. Yes. So I, I, I want to take this opportunity to invite you as the second uh, panelist to give a few yeah. remarks in about 10 to 15 minutes. Mm -hmm. uh, perhaps, uh, now that you sit as the chair of the regulator in this country, uh, mm -hmm. you can perhaps uh, counter some of the things at this point, but also give us your own experience. Mm -hmm. And then perhaps after that, we'll go to the politician, Dr. Nikal, and then finish <laughs> with the policymaker. Welcome, Dr. Eva. Thank you, Naim. And uh, thank you to the panelists. And uh, this is really a good uh, forum, especially very timely at this point when we are faced with the a number of uh, challenges with the changes in amendment, health amendment bills that uh, keep coming and changing. And uh, somehow we are left uh, in awe and wondering what's the next. I want to support uh, uh, Dr. Retrape. He's actually said ex quite a number of my points that I've, 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 I would have uh, talked uh, and uh, emphasized on why we do have to have uh, uh, the health professionals uh, self-regulating and being uh, playing a very big role in the regulation of the, the health profession as it as is. And even just to mention that, uh, would we ask ourselves, we have many other professionals, uh, and like uh, we have the engineers, we have the lawyers, we have the architects and, uh, and so many others. And none of those uh, uh, professional bodies will have people who are not in their profession uh, getting to their regulatory bodies, that they have completely fought nail and tooth and they've succeeded to maintain their, their regulatory bodies to be mainly governed and um, uh, uh, managed by their professionals. And for very, very obvious reasons, and uh, uh, Professor Retrape, uh, Dr. Retrape has clearly stated a good number of them. Uh, one is that who knows best what it is that we go through. You train and you, you go for, through all these years to study whatever specialty you study. And then you need, when it comes to delivering that service or that specialty, if you are a surgeon, if you are an obstetrician and you, you're the one who's gone through all this, you've studied, you, you know exactly what it takes to make your patient get the very best. Who else outside your profession can actually come and help you if you are struggling or you have, if you have cases that are challenging, would you be able to get uh, 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 somebody from another profession to come and tell you, yes, this is maybe the way you should have delivered this baby. This is the way you should have handled this broken limb or this uh, brain tumor. It has to be people within the profession. But the idea of separating uh, the association and the regulator, this is something I've, I'm finding uh, from what uh, uh, Dr. Retrape has said, it really makes so much sense because the conflict of interest, 
for the longest time, Nyaim, you have known, uh, we were in the previous board together, we had representation from the medical associations. And most of the, 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 the times you had either the, the president or the vice president or the secretary participating uh, in the regulatory body. And uh, I like what he says, you cannot, uh, you have to be, the, the association must, be, must keep the, the regulatory bodies on their toes and make them accountable and they are the watchdog. But it is, it is something that we really need to take seriously. But what I really would want us to, to think very seriously about is what is going on now. We know what uh, has happened and uh, Dr. Nkau will tell us the, the requirements now that every regulatory body must be constituted according to Mogozo. And uh, uh, that uh, uh, allows other people who are non-medics to come and sit on the board. It is from some aspects, yes, I don't think it's, the, it's, it's, uh, it's something that is, that, uh, uh, is going to break what the, our, our role and mandate as the, the medics on the, on the council. But majority of the, the people in the regulatory body must be medics. To me, I think that, that should, it, it's no brainer and I don't think it should even be discussed. When you think about the committees that constitute the, the council, uh, the regulatory council, if we have many, we have the registration licensing, we have the, the, uh, the, the inspection, we have the training. Those can only be done by people who already have gone through the profession, who understand what, when you're going to inspect a health facility, you know what is required to deliver the kind of quality health care that you need. Yes, you may have, uh, somebody from uh, uh, um, uh, another another uh, 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 I mean, a body, maybe the, the, we've, had, we've got a lawyer in the in the council now. You may we have had, got somebody from the, the the treasury. We have we are supposed now to have somebody from the attorney general. These people may come in when you you have other issues that uh, that may be discussed. But the, our key mandate is to deliver health quality health and our, our, uh, our, past the, our primary um, goal is to make sure that our patients are taken care of well, they get the best uh, treatment and this can only be done by the, the professionals that are in that council or in that regulatory body. So I think to me, it's a, I don't even see why it should even be a discussion that uh, the, regulatory, the, the regulatory bodies should have any outsiders other than the professionals themselves. And I know these amendments, the council has also put their, their, uh, their input, the medical associations have given their input. And what uh, uh, Dr. Trappe has brought in is, if we make strengthen the medical associations and work very closely so that we really are seeing we are not uh, in opposition and we are not in competition. We are working to make sure that where the, the associations will be out there, be able to talk to their colleagues, be able to get all the grievances, the challenges, and they are able to communicate and even present this to the council. And the council uh, and even suggest solutions. And the council, because it is, it has the, it's uh, been constituted under the law, it has that mandate and has that legal obligation to make sure that these uh, functions are delivered. The other uh, arm of the, 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 the regulator is also to take care of uh, the welfare of the doctors who, or the health professionals who are supposed to be delivering this service, that their environment they work in is, is, is the best, that they are able to, and if you have any that is struggling, he said something, you cannot throw uh, a, a professional out. It's not, uh, we should not be punitive. We should be able to find ways to help any struggling physician or any struggling uh, colleague of ours. And that is why we have now a committee at the council that actually looks into that. Fitness to practice. Fitness to practice is where we, when we have a doctor or a, a struggling, we need to find ways of rehabilitating, supporting, and making sure that our colleague is able to get back into, uh, to, the, to doing their, their work. And then as far as the training is concerned, we need to, when we look at the, the, the curriculum, 
this curriculum can only be set by the various, especially for specializations, can only be set by the professional uh, societies, the medical associations have their role. And, and I think it is important that we, we do have input and the, when it comes to inspecting and of course, even endorsing and uh, uh, the curriculum. We have people on the council who are qualified when it comes to the people dealing with the registration and training, we have committees that sit and should the commit the, the regulatory bodies have been given the power under the act to co-opt uh, professionals that can help uh, to make sure that that what we, uh, we are delivering or, and the curriculum that's been submitted, that they fit the kind of profession, uh, professional specialists we want to get out of the universities. I've seen one of the questions about uh, what, what is going to happen and what is happening when the universities now, the queue, the, 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 uh, the, the, the university education, uh, the, the commission of uh, university education, Nyaim, you know this has been also an issue, but uh, the good thing is that everything, the dialogue helps. We've had dialogue uh, between the Ministry of Education, Ministry of Health, the two cabinet secretaries have spoken and they've actually agreed that uh, Q cannot actually regulate the training, uh, the medical schools. They don't even have that capacity to, and uh, they don't know what to, they can't go and, and inspect, uh, inspect that. So I think it's important that this is, uh, it's been agreed upon. And I think that is uh, something that we know is a plus now for the, for the current council that we've already agreed. But what we do know is that we will include when we go to inspect medical schools, the, the Commission of uh, uh, Higher Education uh, will get a team and they come with us because they do also have their role, but the mandate still lies within the medical uh, uh, council, the regulatory council. So uh, I think Naim, uh, what we need to strengthen and to what maybe uh, the policy makers and Naim, uh, um, Dr. Nikal um, Moheshmiwa, he, he has been he has gone through all these uh, uh, steps. He's been in the system. He's been in the in the medical associations. He's been at the MOH, and now he's in Parliament where decisions are made. He is actually one person who can really sit and uh, 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 tell the policymakers and give them the exact information that is required and why it is so so important that professional bodies should be regulated by the professions. Uh, professional uh, uh, colleagues uh, and doctors uh, themselves, but not people from outside. If we need help in any other area, if we have any area, especially when now that we, when you are the Mogoso, you have you and you are we are under the the, uh, the state agency, and we are required to co uh, communicate and uh, with the treasury, we do have people we can consult. When we do have uh, issues of. Uh, to do the law when we need amendments, when we need rules, we have somebody we, we can uh, consult. We have corporate officers who are uh, a part of administration, but we also have we have we have freedom to uh, to uh, consult the attorney general's office. But that should not dilute our role and our mandate as regulators of ourselves, as physicians, as doctors. We must uh, keep put our patients first. And uh, I, I like the way uh, uh, Retrape said, it doesn't matter whether you're in private, public, that's not, it's not the money parts that, is, that uh, should be our, our key uh, or, or the top of our agenda. If, if we do our work well, if we deliver the health services well, if we make sure we, what it, the, uh, the public, we have the confidence of the public, you will definitely uh, get uh, your, uh, Finances will not be an issue, and I think honestly that's maybe the way we, the way we were trained. Deliver your services. The patients, the public will be confident with you, and you will not lack work. And if it, you, the, the, the institutions employing you, they that is their role to make sure that either the the, the colleagues who are uh, employed get their dues right, they get uh, trained their training. They are facilitated and supported with the devolved health now to the counties, engaging one of our roles now as the council, we must engage the governors, the CECs, 
So that also we know about uh, what uh, our doctors going through. When we post interns, we, one of the things as we go to inspect the, the internship centers is to make sure that these doctors are working in an environment where they, are, they, are, they have a work balance and they will be able to deliver the best services to the, to the patients. Otherwise, if also they, what they have is uh, 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 uncomfortable or uh, the uh, environment that is not conducive, they will eventually not deliver. And of course, then the, uh, the public will lose confidence in them. So I think, Nyaim, uh, uh, I would like first to pause there and uh, maybe there are other, the other, any other questions that come, we'll check uh, on, the, on the question uh, forum and we'll be able to answer as we go. But I do believe that a strong regulatory council, we will uh, eventually end up delivering and we will we'll get that confidence from the public that is so much needed as we change our health uh, systems, health structure, as we move towards universal health coverage, you need a strong body that is aligned to even the associations that work in tandem with the council so that we make sure again that goal is well delivered. Then the councils, the, the associations and their unions must be talking together because we are all working towards uh, the common good of the, our patients in this country. And I think this is important. When you look at the World Medical Association, it is the same point that uh, the TRAPI has, has uh, uh, clearly articulated that the, the physicians or the doctors, they must first put patients first. And this was uh, ratified and uh, revised up uh, uh, the latest in 2019 in Tbilisi. So I think it's important that world, all the world, the, the world over globally, doctors, we must unite and we should borrow best practices. And it, I'm happy that uh, we are looking at the, the uh, perspective, the, the, the South African aspect of how they do it. And I think it's important to, if case where we have, we have AMCOA. So when we meet, we exchange ideas, we draw from each other's, where are you strong? Uh, and where are you weak? What did you do to strengthen your regulation uh, a body? And of course, what else can we do? We continue to improve. There's always room to improve. And we cannot say we've reached the, our best. And I think when whatever challenges, when we have challenges, when we have amendment bills coming in, I think it's very important that we have consultation among the professionals. Are these amendments uh, coming to make life difficult for or making, making difficult for the, the doctors to deliver their services to the people? Or is this making it better for us to deliver our services in a better environment and improve the health of our people? I, I rest, uh, I'll send it back to you, Nyaim, for now, but I'm ready to, uh, to answer any questions. Thank you. Thank you very much. Uh, you've raised very weighty issues. Of course, significantly is that we need robust associations and we need robust regulatory bodies. I can see the questions coming in quite a bit. I encourage the participants to continue posting on the Q&A wall. We shall handle them during the discussion session. At this point, I want to invite uh, my senior and my mentor, Dr. James Wambura Nikal, to also give his comments perhaps in the next 10 minutes. Uh, now that he's gone through and now he's at the political side, let's hear his perspectives. Dr. Nikal. Dr. Nikal. Hello, Dr. Nikal, can you hear us? Okay, he seems to have fallen aside because I can see he's muted. I can see his name is still there, but uh, he doesn't seem to be hearing us. On that, in that, on that note, let me then uh, ask Franco Fuller to give us his uh, thoughts, particularly from the policy aspect, because he's a guru in policy formulation and health systems uh, strengthening. Welcome, Ofula. Uh, thank you. I'm uh, just trying to get my uh, uh, camera on. Uh, just hang on. 
Yeah, so I think generally this has been very enlightening. I, I really, really did enjoy uh, the discussion uh, that has just taken place, uh, particularly you know, some of what I consider really interesting points that, uh, that have been raised by, uh, uh, by, uh, by, by senior colleagues. I'm, I'm back. Daktari, we'll let, we'll, let, we'll let Wafula finish and then okay, we shall invite fine. you next. Let's proceed. Mm -hmm. Okay. 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 Yeah, already, uh, okay, yeah, sorry about that. So, uh, so maybe before I look at the policy implications, which I think uh, Dr. Nikal uh, is probably uh, really able to answer, particularly from a statutory perspective, uh, just a quick reflection on the conversation that I've had senior colleagues uh, have around these issues. And just, you know, just taking a step back, uh, you know, where, you know, where did we come from before we got to this point where we are talking about uh, self-regulation and what it is uh, that we need to do? Uh, so I, I, I sit on a World Health Organization task force that is trying to develop, uh, you know, policy recommendations for the 194 WHO member states on regulating professionals. And part of the work that we've done uh, uh, recently is try to look at what's happening globally across the member states. What, what kind of conversations are taking place and where is, you know, where is regulation of professionals heading to? And two things have struck me from these that kind of directly relate to, uh, to what you are talking about. So one of them, there seems to be a strong global push towards uh, recalibrating the concept of regulation and kind of turning it over its head so moving from kind of regulating uh, the professions to regulating the practice. And we see a very subtle movement towards, uh, towards that in certain countries. Uh, I, you know, we've not seen that in Africa, but there's clearly a movement towards uh, looking at regulating what, for example, a surgical process is rather than regulating the surgeon. And you know, that's one thing that would obviously pose a lot of concerns, particularly since you know that you cannot really separate the, the person from the practice. But the other thing that you know we've, we've seen as a pattern, uh, kind of globally as well, is this uh, mix instruments used in regulation and movement towards you know uh, what you call smart regulation, which is basically just recognizing that nobody really should own regulation; it should be a shared function. And maybe just to put this in context, if you, if, you, if you think about regulation as something that exists within a, a spectrum, uh, on the extreme left, you have full state control, regulatory instruments, very focused on licensing and, uh, and inspections, usually you know, very police style inspections with very little participation of professionals. So we see these are in certain countries, uh, you know, particularly some of the countries uh, with uh, kind of a communist background. And somewhere in the middle, you have you know, what we call kind of responsive and risk-based regulatory systems, where unlike the previous one, where you are looking at one size fits all, and you're trying to box everybody into that box, uh, the, the, the kind of the middle ground is where you look at each provider as they are. So you do kind of a risk profiling, and then you decide, uh, Dr. Nyaim is at this level, so we are going to regulate and encourage them to, to comply to these additional standards. So it's almost like tailoring these instruments in response to the market as a way of encouraging people to improve rather than using the police approach. And this model is still quite often um, uh, uh, enforced directly through government instruments. Now on the extreme right, and this is what you are talking about broadly, is where then there's delegated authority to regulate because as we heard from the speakers, regulation is actually a public function is there for public good. Uh, so when there's a conflict between professional and public good, which should not happen a lot because you know, we all want the same thing. But whenever the, that conflict, uh, conflict arises, then regulation says that you need to, to side with the public side. So uh, on the extreme right, you actually have the public fully ceding or partially ceding this authority to professionals to carry out the mandate on their behalf. And so what you're seeing is this conversation around how can you make all these instruments work? So if I use a very simple example, uh, for instance, if you're talking about uh, involving providers directly in, in, in their own regulation and having systems where providers make returns, they basically report to the, 
regulator telling them, this is where we are, we've done a self audit, you know, this is our performance and this is our continuous improvement pl plan. And in the next quarter, we hope to achieve this. So that, that sets a system where the regulator takes us kind of lies back a little bit and the providers are more involved in this. So that's an instrument that's coming up quite a bit. I know it's getting po gaining popularity in countries like Germany and where licensing is now pegged on you doing you know, those returns to actually show that you're active, you're improving. And if an inspection is done, it's just to verify some of the reports that you've been sending. So I'm not going there blindly to knock in your facility and start turning everything upside down. I'm coming there with a very specific target because based on your last report, you say that you have a challenge with infection prevention and control. And I've come here specifically to look at how you're doing broadly, but also to advise and guide you on how you can improve infection prevention and control. So that's how you can involve, involve providers. I agree with, uh, Dr. Njenga fully. I think professionals now need to take more kind of direct roles when it comes to the technical matters. So whether this is training or practice, but trying to think about defining standards and defining due processes that they need to be followed. But then the government still needs to play a role even with the, with the confines of self-regulation, but then the role perhaps would be more of a backstopping role uh, as opposed to, you know, uh, to, to a very active process of regulation. And you know, again, some of the instruments that uh, are considered kind of best practice involve a mechanism where you actually have an escalated process where you have professionals taking kind of, you know, leadership over the more active processes, but still having backstop at a higher level, which doesn't necessarily uh, concern itself with defining standards and, and looking at what doctors are doing because only a doctor will know what a doctor is supposed to do, but a higher level that perhaps even has lay representation and very much public good that only serves as kind of a backstop to the entire process. And if I'm to be completely honest, there seems to be kind of uh, perhaps not so much in Africa because I recognize that in our setting, we are quite diverse and, and we are seeing quite a lot of models coming up, but globally outside there, particularly in high income countries, there seems to be such a strong favoring of, of that kind of lat latter model that I've talked about. But the reason why you know, we are having this conversation where we are now, and, and I think uh, this, this has been hinted at strongly, is because we've, str we've struggled to separate out, to get the differences between you know, uh, what the union should do, what the professional association should do, and what the regulator should do. And yet they actually have very clear mandates. And usually some of these problems come when the same people sit on, on, on these different uh, entities. I know I have had a lot of debates with colleagues legal, uh, locally around this. And the truth of the matter is it doesn't, it's not a very palatable thing to hear, but the truth of the matter is this work well if you separate them. And uh, it basically means this medical association has a seat there it cannot be the same person sitting there because the primary role of the medical association is to take care of the interests and of, of the professionals and check matters of ethics and, and practice, whereas the regulator's primary role is to just watch out for the public. So there's an inherent conflict. We don't like admitting it. And to be fair, most of the time, the interests are aligned, which are, which are good because a good doctor wants uh, something good. Uh, you know, they, they, they do good and they want good for it, but there, there will be times when there'll be conflict. And so it's important that, you know, we are very deliberate about, even as you are pushing this agenda, we are very deliberate about recognizing that it's not easy. It's not easy to, to, to come in terms to, but recognizing that yes, self-regulation is, is, you know, is, is, is this nice concept is where we want to go. But the truth of the matter is for us, for us to get there, we need to recognize that the word regulation automatically refers uh, kind of broadly to the concept of public good. And I just finished by, again, just taking a step back and again, emphasizing that, you know, uh, so, you know, uh, Baumester is, is, a, is a psychologist who came up with the theory of social regulation. Uh, and, you know, it's, it's, it's not very different, although he applied it obviously in, in behavioral psychology, but the whole idea was he still emphasized four important things that are important for any self-regulatory mechanism to work. And the first one is properly defined standards. And even as we're having these conversations as professionals, do you actually have properly defined and peer reviewed standards? And I'm thinking beyond ethics because I know generally professionals try to define standards for ethics uh, as opposed to actually the practice and, and, and the technical uh, standards. And 
how then do you marry this? Because you have the public sector, private sector, how then do you actually say as professionals representing the entire market, this is what we define as our standards. You need to be very careful about that. The second thing is there has to be a proper incentive for compliance to the standards. So that's, you know, that has to be very clear. And of course, people argue that it comes from training, ethics and everything else, but there has to be a value proposition for me as a provider who's practicing knowing that the police are not watching me to actually do the right thing. The third thing is there to be a mechanism of conformity assessment. So even as professional doing self-regulation, how do you check that the members are doing the, you know, that members are constantly doing the right thing. But the last and the most important thing is what we call willpower, which is basically that deliberate effort by the entire body of the professionals to actually say that, you know, this is the direction that we want to go and, 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 and we are actually going to focus our efforts here towards public good. And that has to be a message that is hammered over and over and over again, because at the end of the day, we, I feel like we are standing uh, in the brink of a bit of, a, of history, if you like to, if, if, if you so wish. Uh, South Africa has a fairly well uh, you know, developed system, but we, you know, we need to praise ourselves as Kenya as well, because we've done remarkably well. Over the last five years, we've kind of changed our regulatory system from a very ad hoc system to a risk-based a joint inspection system where they, you know, this risk profiling of providers and doing these visits. And so that it, it makes it really easy when you have these tools on the ground to then think about moving, taking it to the next level, uh, which is a level of, of self-regulation. But to really make that leap, you actually need, you know, gentlemen like uh, our senior Dr. Nikal to actually look at you as people who are there for public good and actually go on to make legal instruments to then give you the power to carry out that mandate. So I'll stop there for now. Thank you very much, uh, Frank. You've also added uh, very interesting perspectives to this. Uh, and I can see a very robust uh, uh, Q&A as well as uh, WhatsApp I'm monitoring both. But I think we'll take an opportunity to respond to all this. Uh, but now let me welcome uh, my mentor, so to speak, Dr. James Wambura Nikal, to also throw some insight and give us his perspective on this uh, thing called self-regulation by professionals. Dr. Nikal, yeah. you uh, Thank you, uh, Dr. Nyaim and everybody. Well, literally everything I've said, uh, maybe just a political angle, uh, whatever it is what. But let, let, let me start also a bit from the beginning, the self-regulation. The, it is actually for all professions, not just the medical profession, whether they are engineers or architects and so on. Therefore, you, it rises from the fact that you, you have to define a profession, which in my simple view is a body of knowledge and skills that have been developed and actually stored to research over a period of time and practiced uh, by people uh, who have been qualified and trained and uh, certified to do it for, to deliver services to the society. So basically, when you look at that uh, definition, then obviously there's need that that could be regulated. Now, it, it, it's only reasonable that the only people who can do it are the people who know it. And uh, in the medical profession, it is only we who know about, about ourselves and about those skills and about those practices and about that body of knowledge. So really, we, we, are, we are duty bound uh, to actually uh, undertake the self-regulation. And I think what is important is we must always realize why, why do we need self-regulation? Uh, mm -hmm. One, to actually protect the public. And whenever I use the public, I'll also be meaning the patient. I think the public looks at us, that this is an area that we are going to protect them. We also owe it to ourselves that we should protect the public. To me, that is really the very beginning of it. Also, we need to protect the professional reputation uh, and uh, and integrity, and not of, we are not protecting the professional. It is actually the profession 
uh, whose uh, reputation and integrity we must protect. It is upon us. If that is done, then in a way we 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 are uh, uh, protected. Then uh, we also have you have to, we need to maintain standard quality assurance. Uh, as we, we just had the technical issues that need to be looked at again. It is only us uh, who will know, or in any profession, it is only those professionals who will know uh, how that is done. I remember when we did the first tribunal in this country, maybe Dr. Nyaim will remember the one of the late Tesoni. We even had to find out how exactly are we going to do it. It, is, it was quasi judicial, but the issue was technical. So we had to get our chairman, who was the technical person, and again to get a prominent lawyer to guide us. And I hope, hope we are still doing it like that, because that is uh, necessary. Also, we have to uh, maintain ethics. Once you have a body of knowledge that you only, as a group, know about, then the only thing that guides you and to protect the public is actually the ethics that are around it. So I think that is uh, important. Uh, and and we, we are duty bound. And sometimes I wonder whether this uh, obligation, it's our obligation to the society. I wonder whether it is just out of interest or it is some even higher quality. Look at what is what you see. We have just had the result of uh, people pre, pre university entrance uh, candidates, and all the people who have got all the uh, the, the candidates who have got the highest mark are all saying they're going to do medicine. But not long ago, our doctors were under such stress, the issue of even pay, the issue of protection when they are sick and many died. How come the young people who saw this, they're well informed, are still saying, I want to do medicine? There is something that actually moves those people who want to do medicine. And therefore, it is that thing that gives us that uh, obligation uh, to be involved in self regulation and I guess it is uh, in, in, in all professions. Uh, we also have to, re to, to balance between uh, trade and ethics. We, we are human beings, we need to survive, we have needs, we have desires, uh, and uh, we can only get it through the labor of, of, of our hands. But uh, our work our labor is actually special. So we have to really control ourselves so that our need uh, actually uh, do not override our responsibility to the patient. So I think to me, once that is understood by uh, medical professionals, then we are in a good place, in a good position to actually bring out all other things and it will work. We have three basic uh, instruments that actually are there. Mm -hmm. We have associations. Associations, as the others have said, they are looking after the welfare of the, of the, med of the, of the doctors. But our welfare is actually tied to the welfare of patients. I've known this, I've been in many tracks, as you know, I've been in many task forces, as you know. And every time when the, we look like we are more interested in our well-being and not being seen to be interested in the welfare of, of, the, of the public, of the patient. Actually, uh, you, you, you almost see a rebellion amongst the people you deal with. So I've, I've come to the conclusion that uh, our self-interest is served by protecting the public or being seen to be protecting uh, the public. It is particularly difficult in a situation like ours, where you have a public uh, and, and private practice, whether we are in clinic, uh, private clinic, whether we are employed in private hospitals, whether we, we, we are uh, practicing in, in private hospitals. And uh, again, that is where we are challenged, uh, because what will our standards be? The standards must be the same the clinical guidelines must be the same. Everything we do must be the same. Yet we realize that sometimes 
in the in the public sector or when you are dealing with people who who can pay then there are a lot of challenges and that brings me to something that I've, I've always wondered how come we act, we may need when we are looking at this regulation even to look at what are the most cost effective ways to deliver our services regardless of whether we are dealing with a private uh, or public patient those who can pay and those who cannot pay even those who can pay will actually be happier if they have a, a very cost effective uh, means of being treated so that is the, the, the way the the, the, the the association are uh, but then there is also there are also the union and the unions in my mind seem to come very close with the association except that they are more labor oriented they look at the labor issues that are involved and again even when we are looking at the labor issues you always get into an issue where uh, as doctors shall we apply the labor laws exactly as they are the right to picket the right to go on strike and so on and because if you are not really careful about it we may mm-hmm. actually lose the uh, public uh, sympathy even for our struggles but i've also known that when it is clear like uh, during the time of covid i saw there was a lot of public support for the doctors and i concluded that whether you are an association whether you are a union and you are main uh mandate is the welfare that welfare must be seen to take into account the interest of the public then we have the councils and the board these are actually legal instruments uh, that provide the laws and the regulations that give us the the, the beacon uh, you can't even when we have ethics even when we have no we have standards we have no we have to have what says if you do this it is wrong and this will be the sanction so basically that's what the the, the council and the board do and then they say who will do what when where will this be done and so on but all that is actually arising from what we uh, as professionals know in a way it is an uh, it's still a bit uh, a fair amount of self uh, regulation that is why i myself believe that uh, uh, we need to have professionals in the in, in the in the councils and board uh, of course there are the there are the, the reasons to also have other people in the board the consumers in the board uh, and so on but the people who will actually provide the the the, the technical guidance that is required will still be asked again part of self regulation and the only other important thing is then we must split quite well the regulator and the advocate which is the union and the and, mm-hmm. and, the, and the association but uh, you still will not exclude them completely but if 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 you actually mix it up then it becomes uh, really a big problem to deal with in fact the best way in my view is that the unions and probably the the association need not have their uh, their leaders within the regulatory system they can have other uh, doctors in the regulatory system but not the leaders because then the conflict uh, will will, will just render everything and work it then there is legislation now there this is where i think maybe we'll talk about it later but this is where we have really a big problem because when we come to legislation that bring forth uh, the council and the board to a large extent in the legislative process there are still very few medical people and there is still relatively little understanding of Uh, the, the complexity of the profession in the general mm-hmm. body of policy that is why it is important that when laws are being made uh, the, the professionals must take a very active part uh, serious advocacy the advocacy and example the state uh, will power 
that will need willpower because in politics, it is numbers. Whether the numbers are right or wrong, it is numbers. Sometimes people know it is absolutely wrong, but if they have the numbers, they move with it. So we must learn to actually lobby the politician uh, a lot. I'll, I'll say about this at the end when I deal with those. The legislation, we must take part of it so that the councils and the boards, whatever laws they have, take into consideration what we as professionals consider safe and uh, useful for the society and to never be seen just useful for ourselves. What are the challenges that, uh, that, I, that I see? Uh, we mentioned some of them. The welfare of doctors and all other health work, workers against the patient welfare. And why I see it as a challenge, you see it particularly in the, in the, in, in the private, in, in the public sector, and when you are dealing with people who cannot afford, but you, sometimes you feel that the, the state or the society actually makes it the blame, the blame the doctors for the circumstances that even the doctors find themselves in. Um, if uh, facilities are not available, if uh, supplies are not available, and the doctors can't do their job. If the doctors don't come out and say it very clearly that we we need this, and sometimes that alone should be enough for serious almost industrial action, not just now for the welfare of the doctors, but for the welfare of the patient, then we get the public support we need. Uh, that that's a really a big challenge many times. And then there are situations, particularly the private sector, when you are dealing with managed care. Uh, now, the challenge here is you actually find that uh, fellow doctors actually get onto the business side. And, and it's, it's very challenging even for those who are in the business side, who are employed by insurance companies uh, and, 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 so, and, and other managed care organizations. Uh, it's difficult for the doctors who are employed there to actually educate themselves and, uh, and actually go for what the profession needs, particularly if that seems to impinge on the profit motive of people who run mm -hmm. the, health, uh, the health business. Because you see, the medical people are to a large to some extent blamed for the cost of care, yet they are just the last cog in the wheel. They, they, they are the last step. They are the people, they are the, the, the face of the medical profession. But behind them, there's a whole industry that we actually do not control. Uh, so that's another challenge we have. Then we have uh, another challenge is uh, leaders, particularly leaders in government. And the worst bit is when you deal with, uh, with, with, with uh, populism, where people want to, to not do things correctly, but do things that are popular, because not always are popular things correct. And in the medical profession, it is what is correct is correct, but there's only one person who has the correct answer. Uh, and the other million are wrong, then it is that. Whereas in, the, in, in, in uh, politics, it is the number that count. So you get yourself where the priorities and even the, the, the policies in the priorities may not be quite in line what the profession thinks. Again, there is mm -hmm. uh, an advocacy that we have to really get into if we want the whole area of self-regulation to work. Then we have another challenge as, as doctors that I don't know uh, whether we really realize. We lead the medical profession in, in the care of people. There's a whole load of cadres and all this load of gather, whether people like it or not, actually, in my view, doctors are the leaders. But uh, associations, unions, and so on, have become so strong that actually, as doctors, we have to find the best way of having that leadership. And sometimes it is used politically to actually just 
divide the health minister. Doctorate, for the sake of time and discussion, we request that you take another one minute and then we can go to Q. No, I'll take two only. <laughs> so the other area that relates to that is also the management of uh, health institutions. What are our roles in that? If you are not careful, then again, institutional uh, decisions can actually uh, put us in bad state. Uh, let me end up, as you're saying, with the current issue that I know we are all concerned about. Mungoso is not a law. Mungoso is a policy. It can be challenged. Two, what you are seeing in the removing self-regulation from all regulatory bodies in the ministry, not only uh, the, the, the medical council, is something that we have to fight. And the only best way to fight it is get all the cadres together. And let me say very simply, that bill, let it be withdrawn. It cannot be withdrawn from our side on parliament, but if the profession is advocates adequately and is seen to be serious, and it is seen to be a danger if it goes in, then it will be withdrawn. But if it comes, there's a danger that whatever we say, the house can still be mobilized to pass that. Thank you, uh, Dr. Nye. Thank you, thank you very much. Uh, I must apologize because you know, these things require sometimes a lot of time for proper discussion. Uh, I know the time allocated usually is not too long, but I'm sure we'll get another opportunity. So as I thank all the panelists, I want, uh, I want us to then uh, take the questions uh, one by one and see if we can handle them and some comments also. I will start off with uh, an anonymous attendee who says, who, who has the responsibility of training the healthcare workforce? Because uh, he says it's currently a generation of young doc doctors who are training themselves. Uh, so how will this affect the ability of the profession to regulate itself. I see Dr. Ivan Jenga is uh, interested in commenting on this. Dr. Ivan Jenga. Uh, thank you, Nikal. The, who has the responsibility of training the doctors? I think the one, uh, the, uh, we've seen people who have, uh, well, when you and me trained, we actually got uh, 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 our fees paid by the Ministry of Health at some point, and then we also got uh, uh, bursaries or loans from the, 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 the university. So that is a combination of several. And then came the parallel program where uh, uh, doctors or students pay for themselves. So there is a mix. But uh, when it comes to actually regulating or uh, inspecting or monitoring the training, we have a, 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 a responsibility as the medical council to know, to make sure uh, that uh, medical and dental council to make sure that those who are being trained are getting the proper training. About fees paying, there is a mix. So, uh, and you know that for, uh, I mean, all across the, the universities, we have the private and the public universities. Is that okay, Mikhail? Can I say something Jenga? about that? Okay, Dr. Nikal, you want to add something on that? Yes, of the training of doctors, particularly specialists. Let me talk about specialists. We really must put our foot down that specialists are actually trained by the government, whether it is and the national government, not county government, because during training, they are the main workforce. And what I've advocated and we should advocate for is that we get training positions for residents which are paid. School fees, I think, then will be a small matter. But what I hate is that these people are working full time, taking a load of work, and then people are calling them students and not paying them. That, I think, as a profession, we should reject. I've proposed, the budget is coming now, and I'll ask the ministry if they have put money for that. It's also wrong to have the county government paying for them while they're working in institutions that are under the national government. Thank you, Jai. Uh, I want no. to say it, I'm, I'm aware that the Council of Governors is, uh, is plotting not to allow 
people to come for training because they are worried about the issue of fees. So perhaps it's a matter that we really need to look into because we're going to have challenges in terms of getting people to be trained. But I, I guess that's that's an address that needs to needs all stakeholders to consult and agree. Uh, the next I, thing is I'm, will, the, I'm willing. I'm willing to lead it. Okay. The next uh, Thank question you, was about. <laughs> The next question was about Mongozo, but I think uh, Dr. Nikal has alluded to that and I think he's answered it uh, adequately. The next uh, question is from another anonymous attendee who asks, why does the MPDC, is the MPDC supposed to regulate paramedics? Maybe even Jenga, you can comment on that. Uh, uh, under the law, uh, Nikal, we are not uh, allowed, actually we don't have that mandate and this is why uh, we have a body called the Kenya Health Professionals Oversight Authority, which is awaiting to be uh, uh, passed or to be given a board. This is uh, the authority that will now oversee all the other paramedics and all other the, uh, uh, associations or other group of health uh, professionals who do not fall under the category of uh, the medical and dental, uh, the dentist council. So we do not. And we, we already, as you know, we are already having problems uh, even regulating cohorts. And this has, it has been taken us to court. So these are things that the government, uh, the Ministry of Health has to come out very clearly. And uh, quickly we get uh, this health uh, oversight authority to take care uh, of all the other uh, paramedics and other, uh, and, and other professionals that don't follow our, our, our regulatory mandates. Maybe I could comment on that also. No, uh, yes. Or maybe I'll, I'll, I'll comment on too many things. What I think we should look at, and when we put that oversight to those, no, it's okay. What it's, yeah. it's okay. Hello? Yes, continue. We can hear you. Yeah. So when we what we said was we must start looking at what cadres can be regulated under one uh, body. Because we have too many, like the co-host, this is going to quote, I think we need to have to look at it. But we, when we did the Health Act 2017, we wanted them there because eventually they, they will all want to do something like dentists. Like clinical officers now are having, I don't know, BSP in clinical surgery and in clinical medicine and surgery. What is the difference? So we must now start looking at actually harmonize. That was what was meant and that act will be implemented. Thank you, uh, Doctor. There, there is a, a question from Isabel Lorege. Regulating or assessing individual performance of each medical profession is not easy. We are mainly relying on CPDs and current licenses. What's your comment on this and what is the way forward? Maybe Dr. Hossi Letlape can give us an, an insight into that and then the others can comment also. Thank, uh, thanks, Ali. I think the issue of performance assessment of doctors, it's a very difficult one. If you look at the UK system, they've tried to do that, but they are having great difficulties, uh, particularly with partic uh, practitioners that are in private practice. Uh, there's a semblance of being able to do something with people that are employed inside the NHS. Uh, in, in IAMRA, we've been having a topic every second year around the competency of doctors. CPD is not a competency issue. It's just a basic way of checking whether you are keeping up with knowledge within your discipline. Uh, so it, it, it's not an easy thing to do with, but it's dependent on the system that you have. When you have delivery based on the national health system that they have in the UK, it's fairly easy to do because there are records that are not private records, that are institutional records, there are people that you, that you report to, they are seniors in the hierarchy. So it's fairly easy to be able to assess what your outcomes are as a practitioner because you know, the outcomes are recorded inside the system. But if you are in private practice, you record your own outcomes, it becomes uh, quite difficult. So it's a system problem. And what you design will be depend on how you've arranged your healthcare system. And, and, and it's not something that we should run away from. It's something that we should tackle. 
people talk about five year renewal of licensing. Do you do it through examination? Do you do it with peer review? Are you going to have patient portfolios? Do you have 360s where you get a comment from the patients that are being treated by their doctor? So there are many things that need to be considered, but CPD is quite primitive. It's basic, but that's a starting point. You then need to build into, do people have their own profile of the patients that they see, the outcomes that they have? Do you have an electronic reporting system to be able to capture all patient records so that you could at a glance see, you know, I'm an ophthalmic surgeon. So you could probably see cataract, vitrectomy, how many do I do? But you'd need a robust system to be able to pick those issues up. And I think more importantly, you know, I used to marvel at what nurses used to do. Uh, you, they used to do what they call in-service training. So occasionally the nurse would disappear from the ward and go back for in-service training. We should have regular in-service training as part of the way we work so that we don't wait for tragedy, tragedies to occur. Just like in our cars, you know, the light comes up, it goes for a service. There's nothing that says uh, Ellie is a great driver so his car can go for 20,000 kilometers. It's part of the system. So we need to create systems where all of us just go for, you know, revival of what your skills are in an environment that is not punitive, in an environment that enhances, that says, what are the gaps? How do you fill them? Without being punitive, uh, but on enriching. So it's about the ethos of your health system as well. I mean, there's been a question that has been asked about impaired physicians. And it comes to the same thing. If you have an ethos of supporting your practitioners, making sure that they are fit for purpose and they don't see as an ally, that's about to take them out. And you have ethical rules about self-reporting. You have ethical rules about colleagues being compelled to report if you are in trouble. But if it is in an atmosphere of helping people and making sure that they are rehabilitated and not catching them out and taking them out. Uh, thank you, Ali. Thank you, Hosi. That's very well said. Uh, the next one, I can see Dr. Ivan Jenga would like to answer. It's basically about the issue of self-revision from a handicapped position. And uh, Ruth Lucinda says, number one, trust in doctors is very low. The private sector has been uh, labeled as money hungry. Uh, in our efforts to advocate for better health services, we have agitated decision makers and to some extent, the general public. Should be as an association then prioritize gaining public trust as we push for self-regulation. It may be that their confidence in the profession and our ability to self-regulate may indirectly advocate for a case to self-regulate. Dr. Ivan Jenga, what do you say about that? Uh, 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 I mean, uh, uh, sorry, Nyaim, I... That, that question is really, really important and Lucinda has raised a, a very, very important uh, point. We have been quiet. Doctors are timid. Doctors are so busy uh, making patients' uh, lives better, delivering health services, that they don't actually have had time and they haven't had time to go out in public and talk about what they do and how well they do it. And there are very few people who come back to tell doctors, thank you. But we are now as a council or, as, or the regulators must actually highlight. So communication of what our, our profession uh, is about, about what it is we are doing. When it comes to, even right now, I think one place that uh, where we really need to take advantage of is during this COVID. The, during this COVID period, the doctors have really gone out and worked so hard. They worked, worked under very difficult uh, uh, conditions, had very complaining. And I think this has to keep coming out. And it is our law now uh, at the council. We have established a communication uh, uh, department and we are making sure that every day we do post an, uh, something on social media about uh, the role of the council, what our doctors do, and also have uh, members of the council uh, being interviewed, going to social media, we are going to try and even go more into the vernacular uh, 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 social uh, 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 outreads to, act, to communicate. Because yes, we've been seen as mercenaries, people who talk ill about doctors, not, not even 
realizing the amount of work we do, the difficult conditions we work under, had the complaining, working excessive hours. And I've seen questions there. What do you do with institutions that make doctors overwork? And true, as associations and the, the unions, and even as a council, we have a role to make sure that our doctors are working at a healthy environment, there's work balance, so that they can deliver uh, the quality health uh, service that they are supposed to. So it is true, we've been working from handicapped, uh, and the, our handicap is that we are quiet, we are so busy, we are timid, but we need to start speaking positive things that we do and we do a lot of positive things and so this has to come out also the the, the functions of the regulator issues of when it comes to the disciplinary ethics committee when it comes to cases that come out litigations we need to tell the the public the systems that are in place the what is done the processes and also post on our website what cases have been determined so that people can actually because you, should, you hear people say, oh, the council, they don't work. I can tell you the, the committees we have, we have very few members now, especially like how you say that um, Mogoso is a policy, but yet we've, uh, the councils have been set up at, at the, this uh, Mogoso policy. Numbers have been reduced. Mikau, uh, uh, you know, I can tell you we have about nine members at the council during the Nyaim's uh, 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 time and my time previous, but we were 17. So. We were, it was easy to really do a lot of work in different uh, committees. But I think these are things that we need to come out to the public, that the people in the regulatory bodies are working so hard uh, to make sure that the quality healthcare is, is realized in this country. So I believe uh, uh, we must step up our communication. Uh, I mean, line of, uh, of the, the giving that uh, information out to the public. Over to you, Nikau. I mean, <laughs> Yaim, I don't know. I, thank Nikau you. Thank you. My friends. <laughs> I don't know what his name. No. Uh, so okay. Nikau. Just, just a quick one, which I'd like Ofula to perhaps respond to, and uh, somebody else can help him. Uh, Kesa Wanjale is asking How will self regulation aid in regulating the ballooning young doctors and employment, mistreatment by some private entities? Because the above, in his view, waters down the gains of the profession as a whole. Whose mandate is the above, or is it a joint responsibility? Maybe, Frank, you can give it a go. Yeah, no, thank you. I mean, fly on the wall, I've really been enjoying the conversation. So that's a really difficult question, because again, uh, it's, 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 it's one of those things that would possibly uh, cut across uh, kind of the three broad components we've been talking about. So you talked about the union and its role. Uh, and of course, there's a, there's a whole other conversation around the union and, and the kind of weaknesses we've been seeing in some of the unions, uh, including that tension between the EU regulates, you know, because unions come from some kind of, you know, uh, 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 arrangement where, you, you know, and, and if you actually look at a lot of the history of, 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 of these unions, really, particularly during the Industrial Revolution, it came from that kind of a patterned arrangement where it was, about you know government employers and workers, so workers organizing themselves in a way that they can actually jointly do that. So then, how do you uh, unionize people who are not employed? So that's a separate conversation, and 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 so they fall in that block. At the same time, they also fall, strongly fall within the professional association and actually looking out for their interests, and 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 you you know that too. So from a regulatory perspective, I would actually argue that. Uh, you know, uh, so you can look at it in two ways. So uh, strictly speaking, they're a bit distal to the regulatory process because again, the mandate is primarily public good. But on the on the on, on kind of a more perhaps pragmatic way of looking at it is is the fact that there's a lot of uh, uh, I would say sometimes unethical, but sometimes you know borderline uh, you know uh, you know wrong practices that we actually see in terms of norms and standards and 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 who should be doing what and and what we know for a fact is uh, the kind of standards that we put out there require that we have certain norms and standards complied with so a good regulatory system really should be able to you know to 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 uh, i don't want to say uh, to punish those who are not uh, complying with standards in terms of uh, employing the right people but at least it should be able to encourage a culture where 
you know, professionalism is recognized and, and, you know, that ideally should be able to open up a better space for perhaps people who are outside this cycle. Because what happens usually when you have a weak regulatory system, and you've seen, we've seen this uh, in a lot of African countries, is, you know, you end up with, you know, with, uh, with, with practice where you, you have things like, you know, a, a running facility with one professional who is never there or who perhaps works somewhere else. And they have no, they're not incentivized to, to get you as a doctor, as a young doctor there because, well, nobody's checking. And, you know, you can argue about, you know, the business side of it and sustainability, they're all valid arguments, but the truth of the matter is if the standards require that only a certain kind of professional should carry out a certain pro, you know, procedure, then really you should be, should be able to, uh, to, to offer that space. And so theoretically it should be able, it should be able to open up uh, a, a lot more space if this is actually done uh, effectively. And it, by effectively, it basically means self-regulation means the professionals are defining the standards. And I don't think the professionals are going to define the standards that don't actually uh, you know, require that professionals be the ones offering the service. So there's an advantage there. But I have to give a very strong caveat as I finish. So there's, there's, also, there's, also, there's a whole other side of, of this argument around business sustainability and affordability. And there's a gentleman who called John Maynard Keynes who about maybe 70 years ago wrote a very interesting book about rela relationship between workers, unions and wages. And one of the things he predicted was that unions might actually be the ones that on the surface seem to be helping the professionals, but over time they lock them out because they'll keep pushing for higher wages. And when the market starts correcting, it basically looks for other ways of operating without employing more people. So it, 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 it restricts what is called absor absorption of labor. So that's a totally different conversation. So, but generally I think there should be opportunity for self-regulation to standardize and actually expand the space for the providers over can i can i comment a little on that well we we have just about another seven eight minutes so uh I'll be very quick. Yes. yes one that question actually is interesting doctors who are overworked and doctors that are unemployed i think as i said earlier we will need to lobby even for the employment of doctors. That's one. We will have to actually put standards. And now the ministry can actually be pushed to put standards because the ministry is not the one that is actually delivering services. So if you are a level four hospital, we must say it requires this. If a private hospital is say, going to, to, to be licensed and this is the workload, it must have this number of doctors and health workers. We, 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 that will actually take us somewhere because now people just get a few doctors and now they don't care what happened. Uh, so there is one of standards that are forcefully implemented and two, lobby. As I said, when you lobby for improvement of the healthcare of the people, we actually benefit from it. If we lobby for doctors to be employed so that many people are covered, we benefit from that. Thank, thank you, Dr. Nikal. Then there's a very quick one, which you can also take. The, the matter about the Health Services Commission, there are two things about it here. Yeah. The question is, why, why is it that uh, we are finding difficulties to put it in the constitution? And uh, if it came into being, uh, will it uh, help in standardizing the training, deployment of doctors and professional regulations? Dr. Nikal, can I, uh, please, before you answer, uh, I, today we had the, the amendment bill on the advisory council, exactly that's supposed to be almost uh, uh, covering what the Health uh, Service Commission was supposed to cover, but is, is being made put to you, to the Health Committee, Parliamentary Health Committee, to, to look at it. And you've asked for public participation. My question is, and it's exactly the same question about why can't we put this in the constitution? This would take care uh, about our, uh, the employment, the, the training, it will take care about posting doctors in different places. I think it would solve most of our problems. Maybe you can help us. Thank you. Oh, you, you, you want me to say something about that? The reason well, why it is hard. Hmm. Yeah, just a quick comment, Dr. Nikal. A quick comment is the governors 
we would hate to have uh, employees, people working under them, who is not employed by them. That simply is the question, the thing we have to convince them about. Uh, the advisory body, we actually put it in the Health Act 2017 because we thought it was a step towards that. In my view, it was something that we can try, but the, the eventual thing, which would be nice if we would have it in the health, in the, in the constitution. Very much. There, there, there is a, an important, uh, interesting question by Regina Mutave here, where she's talking about uh, many cadres uh, and paramedics who are regulating themselves. But at the same time, there's what we call task shifting, where we are putting more clinical tasks in the hands of these cadres. And then doctors are blamed when things don't go wrong. Uh, what, what would be the view of the panelists on this? And perhaps I'll ask Dr. Hossi Letlape to talk about it and then even Jenga. Uh, thanks, Naim. I, I think that's part of the problem where as doctors and leaders of doctors, we should take full responsibility for what has unfolded. And what we have adopted in Africa is basically we silent on a health caste system where silently there's health for the poor in a country and there's health for the rich. You know, if you're rich and you're part of the middle class in South Africa, if you have a hangover, you, you get to see a neurologist with a neurosurgeon and physician on standby. If you're poor and you have a brain tumor, you're going to be seen by the community health worker. And that's something that the medical profession is silent about. And once you have this caste system, where we don't fight to say anyone that needs a doctor in our nation should have access to a doctor. And we become part of solving that problem. We abdicate and we have all the systems where task shifting happens in the public sector. And we jump up when those people that are taking care of, uh, of our responsibilities in the public sector now want to go private and compete with us privately. And we then jump up and say, no, they can't do that. So we got to wake up to the fact that we have not protected the profession. We have bought into the issue of what you can pay and we've been silent as the health system gets destroyed. The issue of unemployed doctors, it's a system issue because we keep saying we need doctors, but we're not advocating for a system that's able to absorb what we produce. Occasionally, there'll be imports from Cuba, despite the fact that your own production is not being incorporated into the system. No health planning, no solidarity, that becomes a part of the problem. And it goes to the issues where we've been negligent, even when you have unethical behavior, where doctors that work for insurance companies dictate to other doctors. In our laws, we have ethical rules that we are not upholding about supersession, about what they can do. We now even allow people that have not, that are not licensed practitioners to practice medicine. When insurance companies tell doctors what to do and the associations and the regulators are silent, what do we expect? We got to stand up and be fit for purpose, promote professionalism and protect our professional turf and ensure that our population get the care that they deserve. You know, I mean, I see in South Africa, we're taking safaris to go elsewhere. There's a private sector. I see in Kenya, there's health in the counties, but there's health for the elite. You go private or you fly to India. It's time we led. And lastly, Ellie, the association, the training institutions and the professional societies. That's where the rules of the profession are made. The regulator, that's where they are upheld and enforced. Mm -hmm. And we, if we go out with that frame, that clinical standards will come from the profession, but enforcement will come from the regulator. The regulator doesn't dream up ethical rules. They come from the profession. The association is key in that. The professional societies are key in that. The training institutions are key in that. But the enforcement is done by the regulator. If there's a complaint, it shouldn't come to the association. And lastly, when people sit on the regulator, 
they must put the regulatory duties first. Whether you've come from the KMA or you come from the urologist, when you sit there, you are not representing the sector that you come from. You are bringing that expertise into the regulator. And you are not representing the association. You are representing self-regulation of the profession and you ensure that the regulator is fit for purpose. Thank you, Naim. Thank you, Kosi. I can see Van Jenga smiling. I don't know that she wants to add anything. <laughs> please, uh, please unmute yourself, Doctor. Okay, I'm agreeing with uh, with uh, with the the, the traffic. I, and honestly, this is what I started by saying. We've been timid. This is the time to actually. Uh, rise up and be strong. We cannot keep uh, silent when you see different cadres that are actually taking over uh, our work. And uh, of course, when mistakes happen, it's the doctors that are going to be blamed. When uh, we, we get people who are going out there without being licensed through the regulators or who are not being regulated, then we're in trouble. And so I think there is a high time. Uh, somebody asked a question, when shall, shall we have uh, uh, the regulators uh, requiring all professionals either to be part and parcel of uh, associations and that will make sure that all the associations say to become a member of the association, you must be licensed. This way, if we are working that tandem, we will be all uh, talking together so that when we fight a problem, we rise up and fight. I mean, we cannot actually just be sitting back when you see things being done and then of course, as far as the public is concerned, they don't care. They say, they say need doctor, there's a doctor. And honestly, that's, those are things that we are going to make sure, and we must make sure that this is well known. That is the information. We need to tell people who are doctors, who are in the medical associations, dental associations, and who are in the other cadres, who regulates the other cadres. When you have problems with a certain cadre who is not at our regulation, where do you go? Do not. Uh, just uh, make a blanket uh, uh, comment that the doctors in Kenya, the doctors uh, in this county are like this. And I think uh, 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 Honorable Nikau has said clearly that when it comes to devolved health, we still, even as regulators, must have a, a platform where we can talk with the, the governors, the CECs, and let them know that there are some things that the regulators will not take when it comes to treating the doctors. Just because you employ the, a doctor does not mean that uh, you, you actually are in charge of the quality of the service that they deliver. Yes, you are in charge in making sure that they have the tools, but that doctor has to have work balance, have to be in a, an environment to be able to, have, to be mentally stable, to be able to uh, deliver health services to the people. And that, of course, will uplift uh, the popul popularity of the leaders in that county. If the doctors are doing well, the community is healthy, the, the outcome and the, even the economic power for that community will rise. So I think it's important that we are all responsible and we must act uh, responsibly and actually action. Instead of just talking and having rules being uh, sent out there and posted on websites, we need to be seen to be acting. Over to you, Naim. Thank you very much. And thank you, Retrape. I was smiling because you are saying exactly what I believe. Thank you. Yes, uh, I, I must apologize to the attendees uh, because of constraints of time. But in a, in a roundabout way, I've sampled these things. And I think we have, we have actually responded to a lot of the things that were raised. I know there are many others that we could not touch. I believe that came as the organizers have an option of questions being sent so that they can be answered by some of these uh, panelists individually. And uh, from the interest that I've seen that has been generated today, certainly, certainly KMA, we must create more of these forums to discuss, not just in self-regulation, but many other things that concern us. But as I summarize, the important thing that has come out here is we must have strong regulatory bodies. We must have strong professional associations. We must develop clear pathways of interaction and collaboration between the two sides. Because basically we are, we are two sides of a coin and we cannot separate. So on that note, I want us to uh, stop the discussions now. 
As I hand it over back to KMA, Dr. Amo Sotara, the Vice President, please take over from here. Thank you very much. Are you still on board? <laughs> Dr. Otara. Okay, Dr. Simon Kigondu, I can see you. Allowed. Sorry, sorry, sorry. Uh, I'm, I'm, I'm here, Dr. Nyaim. Yeah, I'm handing over uh, to KMA and uh, you have the task of taking, uh, telling us what is next and uh, what we should expect maybe in terms of CPD and the other things. And I must thank the panelists quite a bit. Thank you very much. Hello, this is, uh, uh, thank you so much, uh, the panelists. Uh, I, on behalf of the Kenya Medical Association, the National Executive Council, really appreciate the time and uh, uh, the input that you have given into this very important uh, discussion on self-regulation, coming particularly at this time when uh, there are real threats from uh, the same people we expect to be protecting the profession and its growth. I really appreciate the words that uh, all the speakers of uh, Putin, Gossi, uh, uh, Gossi, I can't pronounce the name very well, but I really appreciate the fact that uh, you stated who we are as uh, medics. Uh, our role first is the patient, and we should uphold our ethics. Uh, you brought in the issues of uh, cooperatization of the practice and uh, all these things about conflict of interest, which I really want to appreciate. Then uh, we are at this level where we need each other in terms of the health fields that are being generated right, right, or center, left, and all this. And we are hoping that uh, KMA, if uh, we all come in and work together, we should be able to address the things that are being put as obstacles in front of us. We know where we are. We probably know where we need to go, but first and foremost, we must identify the challenges. So, uh, Dr. Nikal, our representative in uh, uh, in Parliament, we are praying that uh, we shall be able to overcome these wars. But as you rightly say, it requires a lot of lobbying and other interaction. So, with that, members, I really want to appreciate you all for attending, and uh, all the panelists. Uh, you've done a great job. Uh, we have quite some tasks at hand, and uh, uh, with uh, that uh, uh, spirit, I'm sure we are up to the task. Thank you so much, and have a good evening. Thank you. Thank you. Thank bye, you. everybody. Thank, 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 thank you, and bye, you. everyone. Thank you, KMA, thank you for so much. And, uh, because of the interest that has been uh, uh, displayed, we are sure we are going to have one or more other engagements along this. Uh, topic of uh, not just self-regulation, but also uh, medi medical laws and other things, the legal issues that affect our practices. Thank you so, so much, and have a great evening, all of you. Okay. Bye. Bye-bye, all. Bye. -bye, oh. Bye. <laughs>